Dr. John Piper, in his book, Future Grace, writes these words. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied with him. Satisfied with all that God promises for us in Jesus. I'm going to come back to this quote and repeat it several times this morning in light of the text that was both read and then prayed today. This is Paul's second prayer. The first prayer was found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And there, Paul's prayer, if I could put it in a nutshell, is that we as believers would come to know God more intimately. Well, now Paul's getting back to this second prayer. He began it back at the beginning of chapter 3, but uh, he went on a diversion, which is typical of the Apostle Paul. And so when we come to the 14th verse, he's now getting back to this prayer. Paul wants us to know the power of Jesus' love and to experience that love for one another. It's just that simple. Well, let's take a look at a very extraordinary prayer, beginning in verse 14. For this reason, and you'll recall, if you go back just a few verses to the first verse of this chapter, Paul says, for this reason. But now he picks back up. He's uh, said what he wants to uh, in this diversion. Now he's getting back to where he was in his thoughts. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. So he's picking up on this sense of, what he's about to express that he has probably been praying, but I take, it, even in these moments as he's writing this letter, this becomes his prayer. I kneel before the Father, and in being implied, though not written, of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is very, very unusual, because Jewish people, for one, in the first century world, almost never knelt to pray. They would stand to pray, that was the custom. The only time that you would find someone, certainly even in scripture, praying is when there was unusual emotion or passion or earnestness in what they were praying. For example, you'll recall Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where he knelt down and, and he poured out because of the intensity of the agony of his communion with his father at that point. So at this point, Paul is obviously doing something very unusual. He says, I kneel before the Father. And sometimes when you, you read the words in, in your Bible, um, that little word before doesn't seem all that important. But when I was reading it in the New Testament language, uh, there's the little word pros, P-R-O-S in the Greek language. And it's very important. When he says, I kneel before the Father, it means I am kneeling and I am before him face to face. Uh, up close and very personal in conversation. Paul's exemplifying what he's just said in chapter 3, verse 12. There he says, in him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. This boldness and confident access to God the Father through Jesus, he's now saying, I'm kneeling, and this is a face-to-face, -face, a heart-to-heart, -heart, a very direct conversation with the Father. And I would take it that perhaps even as Paul is perhaps quoting these words to his recording secretary... Um, he's describing his physical stature. I am kneeling. And he's going to speak freely. He's going to speak without fear. He's humble in his submission to his heavenly father. But his father is approachable and with whom he can be bold and confident in what he asks of him. Verse 15. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named... Now, there's a play on words here. Again, I don't often like to get into Greek words, but uh, you can't see it in the English language. But he has kind of a play on words in verse 15 as compared to verse 14. In verse 14, he says, I kneel before the Father, before patera in the Greek language. But this play on words in verse 15 is when he talks about the family, whom every patria, in heaven and on earth is named. So he's doing this play on words that the, the Greek readers of this letter would have picked up on right away. He's praying before the patria, out of whom every patera is named. What's Paul's point? Well, 
naming in the Bible is significant. When someone names something, it means that they have dominion over what it is they've named. God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility, Adam in particular, to name the animals dominion over creation. Well, in this case, Paul's simply indicating that the God and Father to whom he's praying is sovereign, both as creator and as ruler over what? Well, look at what it says in that verse. He talks about the family, but not just any family, every family in heaven and on earth. You'll recall that as we've been going through this, the idea of family is groupings. And in heaven, whenever he's mentioned heaven, it's the angelic realm. Both the good angels and the, I can't even say not so good, the evil angels, as it were. These groupings of both good and rebellious angelic realm, he is the sovereign and the ruler over all the groupings of the heavenly realm. But then he also says that this God is sovereign over all the different kinds of people groups that you can have on this planet. All the cultures, all the races, all the different things that divide humanity. He says he is the almighty, he is the sovereign, he is the only one, and this is the God to whom I am now face to face and I'm lifting up my heart even as I bend my knee before him. Let's pay attention to a petitioning prayer as he gets into the details of what he's praying. In verses 16 and 17, he prays to be strengthened in the inner person. Okay, Look at verse 16. I pray that he may grant you, according to riches, the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his spirit. Paul's praying that his Father in heaven may give to the Ephesian believers according to the riches, according to the wealth of God's own glory. Now you'll recall that we've talked about that word glory. Paul's simply praying that out of the source of who you are, God, the weightiness of who you are, the significance, the grandeur, the magnitude of all that you are as the eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, sovereign God, that out of who you are, I pray that according to the riches of that glory, all of what belongs to you and the greatness of who you are, what does he pray for? I pray that he may grant you, according to that glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through the Spirit. He's praying for the Ephesians to have a sense of fortitude, determination, uh, the ability to endure. I pray that this God out of himself will give you everything necessary and required that you may be found with strength and power, fortitude and determination, that you would persevere. And will you please note that that ability and capability only comes through his spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, when you read about him in the Bible, he's frequently identified with the power of God and the person of God as the third person of the Godhead. Where does this action of strengthening of power, this endurance, this fortitude, where does it take place? In the interior life of each one of us as believers in Jesus. In other words, it's at the heart level that Paul's praying that this action would be done. Um, that it would be found within we, each of us, that there would be a sense of, of within our heart, that, that stick to that endurance in our relationship with God. Now, why would he pray this kind of prayer for the Ephesians 2,000 years ago? Well, if you go back to verse 13, look at what he has said there. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. If these readers were discouraged, and I take it that most likely they were, because Paul has been in prison for at least four years and really up to almost five years. He's been away from them for seven years. Those who really knew Paul certainly had a concern for his well-being, but as they evangelized, as others came to faith in Jesus through this gospel, they certainly would have told them about Paul. They would have mentioned his teaching ministry. And so all of these people had a growing concern. And as he's suffering in imprisonment, it brought discouragement to their hearts. But I think that there might have been a second reason why they needed a prayer like this for endurance, to, to have the stick to to keep walking with Jesus. 
because they might have been suffering hostility as well. Most likely they were in Ephesus. They weren't worshiping at the temple of Artemis. They weren't offering up the sacrifices to the Caesar. And whenever these religious occasions were going on, they were um, distinctly absent from society because they didn't participate. Because Jesus is Lord. Because Artemis is not the great Savior. Jesus is the great Savior. They practiced what they were holding on to. But life got difficult for them because of that. And life got very oppressive because of that. So Paul's praying, and I think it makes sense that he's praying that there would be a strengthening of their inner heart to have a sense of endurance, that God the Father may bring to their innermost being a spirit-enabled capacity and ability to endure with fortitude in their relationship with Jesus, to not give up. And then he says something else in this verse. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his spirit, verse 17, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now you might say, well, Dave, doesn't Jesus already dwell in their hearts through saving faith? Yes, he does. He pointed that out in chapter 1, verse 13. So what's he praying for here? That God would bring to that inner heart, that inner being, that Jesus would settle down and be at home ruling there. That's what the language means. That not only Jesus would simply be there abiding, but that he would be ruling. That he would settle down and be at home in the very center of their lives. Becoming the controlling factor in their thoughts. Becoming the controlling factor in their attitudes and in their actions. And how does that take place? Well, he says in verse 17 as it were, that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith, that he may dwell, he may settle down, he may rule as you trust him, as you lean upon him, as you are dependent upon Jesus in a conscious way in the midst of your daily lives. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Christ Jesus. To be strengthened in the inner person. That's part of the petition. But he also prays to, for us to be able to comprehend this, this love of Jesus, the Messiah's love. Verse 17 continues, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love. Paul's acknowledging something that already exists. He says, I pray that you, but having been rooted, having been established in love, it's a reference back to everything that he's written about way back in chapter one. What's he referencing? That you've been rooted and you're established in this love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, he's talking about the fact that they've been chosen by God in eternity past in his sovereign will. That God predestined them that they have been redeemed, they've been purchased at a price. They've been made God's very own inheritance. They have been sealed by the Holy Spirit for everything that lies in front of them that's yet coming. They've been made alive in Jesus, having been dead in their trespasses and sins. They have been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. They have been placed in equality, Jews and Gentiles and all the different varieties of kinds of people that can make up this local thing called the Jesus people. In fact, they've been rooted and they have been established in the love that made it all possible. Paul's praying that the same Jesus would be in full control of their hearts, be in full control of their inner world where they think and where they will and where they allow him to exercise his controlling lordship. Verse 18 I pray that you being rooted and established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. He's wanting these Ephesian believers to have a mental grasp of the love of God. Not that they haven't had that grasp of the love of God for they have seen that love in Jesus, but there's an expanse of learning and growing and gaining a greater sense of of mentally getting your mind around that love. What's he talking about? He wants them to have this love reflecting on what he's written in chapter 1, 
You know, sometimes when you look at the teachings and the doctrine of chapter 1, it's, it's deep. I understand. We, we can't fully grasp it. Some people say, well, why should we even think about these things? Because of what he's saying right here, that you might have that growing comprehension. That you might mentally wrestle with what you will never get your mind around, as it were. But then he wants them to have this. And will you please note to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love. Gaining this mental understanding of the love that God has for us cannot occur in isolation. Because he says you need to have it with all the rest of the saints. It's only in association with other believers in a local context of a local gathering of the Jesus people. We call it a church of many churches. And then Paul uses four different terms to describe this love. And they're all terms of measurement. And rather than trying to parse what each of those means, you just step back and realize he's talking about the vastness of God's love. We sang about it today. It's talking about the the immense dimension of this love that will be forever a learning point for us mentally as we meditate, as we think, as we reflect on all that God has done, not just for me, not just for you personally, but for us. So that the people we relate to, what God has done and for us, he's done for that person as well. That's why they're in Jesus. When we grasp what God has done for everyone and then it begins to stretch us and grow us in that sense of comprehension of just how vast God's love is. God's love is great and vast in that he saved me when I was yet a sinful person. But not only me, look at the likes of all the rest of the sinners in the room that he saved. What love is this? <laughs> and such a love yields fortitude and determination in our relationship with Jesus Christ allowing the Messiah Jesus to exercise his will where it counts in our mind, in our hearts, as we live as the church in relationship with each other, where God's spirit dwells as in a holy sanctuary. <laughs> to comprehend the Messiah's love. God is most satisfied in us when we are most satisfied in him. Satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Christ Jesus. To comprehend the Messiah's love, he says in verse 19, to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't know about you, but I ask questions, and when I come to verse 19, he talks about knowing the Messiah's love. In verse 18, he's talking about comprehending the Messiah's love and I ask the question, well, what's the difference? Is there a contradiction between comprehending mentally and knowing when he talks about knowing this love of Jesus? Well, verse 18 is talking about a mental grasp within the context of the true truth of the Word of God, like chapter 1. And as we meditate, as we think about what God has done for us, that he spells out. And then we think about what he's done, not just for us, but for all of those who name the name of Jesus, who have placed their faith and trust in him. But then he brings it back to the context that it has to be that we think about these things corporately together. Why? Because we go beyond just mentally thinking about it. Verse 19, to know means to know by experience the Messiah's love. If verse 18 is we mentally grasp, verse 19 is and then we live it out and experience that love of Jesus as we relate one to another. Relational experiences of sacrificial selflessness as we both give out that kind of love to one another and receive that kind of love from one another. You know, it's one thing to give out that love selflessly, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard from individuals say, but there was a time when I was really in need and other people wanted to give to me, and oh, that's humbling when they want to love me in return. But that's exactly what God wants us to learn from one another, both to give and to receive a selflessness in all the ways that the Bible talks about, loving one another, bearing one another's burdens, rejoicing with one another, crying with one another, all the one another phrases, loving as God shows us how to love. 
Folks, that cannot be done in isolation. That cannot be done under the roof of just you and yours. That has to be done in the corporate body of what we call the local church. It is indispensable to the work of God helping us to grasp the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's why I am such a champion defender of the church. And then to be filled with God's fullness, for he closes out, so that you will be filled with all the fullness of God. When we love like that, both mentally in doctrine and experientially in relating to one another, that moral excellence, the perfections, the power of God being lived out, what does he say? We will then be filled with all the fullness of God for the greatest of these God's word says, is love. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Christ Jesus. Two more verses. We need to come to terms with a limitless prayer. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Paul's ending this prayer with a doxology, praising the Lord. He's wrapping up this entire section, chapter 3, but really the first three chapters, he's wrapping it up with this doxology. And I think he has in mind certainly what he's just prayed for in verses 14 to 19. What has he prayed for? We've just gone through it all. So now what does he say? Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Paul's point here is that God is able, he is capable of exceeding and surpassing over, above, beyond, more than, very far beyond in excess, whatever he could even possibly verbalize in his prayer for the Ephesians that he's just verbalized. I thought of this. How many times we memorize a verse like we do of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And we pray it, and we throw it back at God in our prayers. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that I could ever ask or think. So what are you asking or thinking? But when you put it within the context of these verses, that's what Paul's talking about. That God can go above and beyond and exceed all that we ever think or ask pertaining to the love of Jesus Christ in understanding what he's done for us in eternity past and stepping into time and space, not only to save us, but what he's done for everyone who names the name of Jesus. And then what he is able to do as we come together again and again and again as the Jesus people interacting with each other relationally so that that love is being expressed. This is a prayer for indwelling power. This is a prayer for the lordship of Jesus. It's a prayer for a lifestyle of agape love within the relational connections of those of us who name the name of Jesus. And then he says, according to the power that is working within us. God's capacity in his omnipotence, he's able to do this because Paul says he's already working powerfully within us. (laughs) He's looking back to chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength, which he demonstrated this power in the Messiah raising from the dead. The resurrection power is already ours. It's already at work. It's already powerfully changing and transforming and altering who and what we are. So he comes back and he says to him who is able to do above all according to that power that's already working within us. God is unlimited in himself. He is unrestricted by Paul's requests, even whatever he might be able to imagine for his fellow believers in Ephesus, like what he has just prayed. To him be glory in the church, in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul's praising this omnipotent God. He is able to do the unimaginable. He's already at work so powerfully. Doing what? Taking the variety of who makes up the church, all of the backgrounds, all the differences, all of the things that might push us away from each other and making one new man, making one new body, making the ecclesia, the gathering of the Jesus people we call the church. 
tearing down all the dividing walls of hostility so that his doxa, his glory, the splendor and the radiance of his greatness can be seen. Where? Where in this world? In the church. In us. And through God the Son who abides within us. From generation to generation, I love what it says in the Greek language, Ionas ton, Ionon. <laughs> Don't say that twice. Ages of the ages of the ages of the ages. From generation to generation to generation. And here we are, 2,000 years removed, and what Paul has prayed for in this doxology as he praises God is true in Rapid City, South Dakota right now. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus, even to this generation. And then I actually looked up the last word. In Greek, amen. In Hebrew, amen. So be it. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Christ Jesus. Paul wants us to know the power of the love of Jesus and to experience that with one another in our relationships with each other. I don't know if you knew, but there was a wedding yesterday. And a good portion of the world was watching it. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle were married. And there was a bishop of the Episcopal Church who gave a message. I hope you listen to things like this with discernment. Michael Curry is the man's name. By the way, he's a champion for same-sex marriages. He spoke of the power of love to change the world. And while he mentioned God sending his son into the world, he never indicated why. He talked about the power of love being redemptive. I'm not sure anyone in that room knew what the word meant. And I thought, but redemptive from what? And redemptive to whom? And when you really listen to what that message for 13 minutes was all about, and I did early this morning, the focus throughout and at the end was on humanity's ability to love. Totally isolated and separated from what kind of love the word of God talks about. It was not about the glory of our God. It was not about the cross. It was not about a couple who had been living together and now walking down an aisle to be married. It wasn't about sin. It wasn't about the need for repentance. It wasn't about any of that. It was just love for love's sake. And that is, my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, is how the enemy twists true truth to make it sentimentalism, which he even talked against but in the end, that's all he presented was sentimentalism. Not the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which changes lives. That's the love the Apostle Paul's talking about in this passage. That's the love of not just trusting Jesus, but knowing and understanding and grasping that as he dwells within us, he exercises his rulership in our lives to transform us that we would love a love that cannot be mimicked or matched outside of the Spirit of God through us. 
And that's the love that God calls us to. As his people, as a body of believers. That's why the local church is vital, key, central to everything that God's doing in the world. And that's why every confessing believer in Jesus Christ needs to have a fellowship of like-minded people born of the Spirit of God in what we call the ecclesia, the gathering of the Jesus people, the church. And that's the platform in which God demonstrates love in and through our hearts to one another. I don't know about you, I am so grateful I'm not going through life in isolation. Paul's prayer is that they would have endurance no matter what was happening to them as followers of Jesus together. And in that endurance that they would experience mentally but also experientially a love that only God can produce as we walk the path that he has for us. I'd like you to bow your heads. We sang about that love today. Almost makes me want to go back and sing it again. I'll get a chance to unless you want to come to the second service. <laughs> oh, the love of God in Jesus Christ, centered in the cross, who came and redeemed us and saved us and entered into our lives and exercises by his Holy Spirit that work of constantly making us to reflect Jesus. To his own praise and glory in the church now and forever from generation to generation. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for a love that we will never fully be able to get our minds around. But a love that we not only wrestle with and mentally engage with, but a love that captures our inner world, our hearts that draws us and calls us and empowers us in selfless ways, in a thousand ways toward one another to express that love. Never worrying about payback, never worrying about recognition, just giving and giving and giving and giving and giving of ourselves so that the grandeur and the greatness and the magnitude of who you are can be to your own praise and glory. I thank you for the church. I thank you for this church. I thank you for those occasions and opportunities when we can love one another. And I pray that as Paul prayed, that you would increase that mental grasp, that you would increase the experiential interactions to cause us to be all that we are in Jesus. For that power already is at work within us. May we allow you, Holy Spirit, to continue that work. from generation to generation till Jesus you come. Amen? So be it. You're dismissed.